ever seen a man on his wedding day? Every man has the same look. You look like you were kidnapped and you're trying to figure out how you got there. People also ask me, like, uh, where's the best place to eat sushi? I was like, hey, let me look it up in my DNA. <laughs> People think that comedy is easy, that they can just step up on the stage and uh, and and be funny. But it, it really uh, is a hard a hard craft. It takes a lot of time. I feel that the difference between clean comedy and so to speak vulgar and blue comedy. I think it takes a better comic to be a clean comic. I got to admit, it's not ladylike, but I finally got some before I got here. Give it up for me. Went back for round two, and can you believe the batteries fell out? That's not clean. Is that considered clean or suggestive, I wonder? Hi, I'm Freddie Vernell, and I am a comedian from Washington, D.C. I've been doing comedy for about three and a half years. I was in the mall earlier today, and I saw this pocketbook that cost $5,000. I think it's something that um, has always been in me. I kept throughout my life hearing people say, you're missing your calling, you're missing your calling. Somebody had faith in me before I had faith in myself and said, look, I, you need to go out to an open mic and just write three minutes of material. And that's what I did. And then the audience laughed. So I was like, wow, I can do this. The only way I'd pay that much for a bag is if it were made out of my ex-boyfriend. <laughs> and they're like, oh, is that a Chanel? No, it's a Darnell. <laughs> I don't think we can underestimate how much use comedy gets put to, especially in a democratic, diverse country like the United States. It can always explore the edges of what's considered acceptable. In other words, an awful lot of comedy, let's face it, is funny because it's offensive. And in moving to those edges, you kind of help define them. In issues that are highly controversial, sexuality, for example, gender, race, Comedy rushes in where angels fear to tread. It can say anything. It can be outrageous. It doesn't have to be the truth. It doesn't have to confirm its sources. Major journalistic operations in the United States were really dropping the ball in those months leading up to the second Gulf War, the war in Iraq. Comedy moved into that vacuum. You had programs like The Daily Show, which were just raking the journalistic establishment over the coals. And it eventually woke them up, and they began to re-emerge into the job that they were uh, supposed to be doing. I think in that case, comedy played a really important political role in this complex discourse that's going on in a country. I, uh, I'm from Texas. I'm from the great state of Texas. Woohoo! Where it is perfectly legal to shoot someone for in white after Labor Day. <laughs> if they're your best friend and you mistake them for a bird. <laughs> right? When I started being funny, just funny, I thought about being in show business, a black comic was not permitted to work a white nightclub. You could sing, you could dance, but in America, you weren't permitted to stand flat-footed and talk. Then I went in the army, and they said, your funny's gonna get you in jail. And they told me, to, you know, you a comic? I said, yeah. Then you go down to the officers' club and prove it. Hey, I walk on stage and said, I got arrested today for impersonating the officer. I slept till 12 noon and all that kind of stuff. You know? I mean, stuff I was doing making white people, I'd be ashamed of today. And then I went to Chicago to look up a friend of mine that I met in the army. So then the next thing I knew, I went to a little black nightclub. I paid the MC to let me on stage. And I walked on stage and funny God. And so that's how I started, and then started, and then all at once the word started getting out. And then from there I went to the biggest black nightclub in Chicago, which was Herman Roberts. One day, 
Herman Roberts brought in Sammy Davis Jr., Count Basie, Joe Williams. So that meant everybody who was anybody was there. And pimps and the holes and the hustlers. But Hefner was there. They made a deal that I would MC. And in between MC, I'd do some little funnies. And Hefner heard it and, and knew it was a different level. Well, then they brought me in to do the one day at $50. I couldn't believe it was that much money in the world. The Playboy had found out that the carousel room had been rented out to a white southern frozen food delegation. And so they thought well, what I was doing, it wouldn't go over. So Victor Lounge, who ran the Playboy Club, was waiting to tell me I didn't ever go on. And you know, who cares? You, got to, you pay me. But I was so nervous about getting there on time. When I got to the Playboy, I asked the doorman, black guy said, where's the carousel room? He says, second floor to the right. Now, when I'm running up, I see this white man standing in the way. I don't know. That's, <laughs> he is the playbook. Book. So I pushed him out the way <laughs> so, and ran in the room, jumped up on the stage at 8 o'clock, and started talking. And at 11.30, I was still on stage. At 12 o'clock, they sent and woke Hefner up. And Hefner came. And I walked off the stage about 2.30. Hefner brought me in for two weeks, and that's where Time Magazine came in, and they was all hearing this buzz about this Negro. They reviewed my act and was on the cover of Time Magazine. I just knew I was going to get on the Jack Paul show. I mean, other than just a belief. And then thank God for Billy Eckstein. Billy Eckstein was cussing Jack Paul, man. I saw this jump on him. Jack Paul, my man, man. And he said, man, Jack Paul, he ain't never let a nigga sit on the couch. And you know, I didn't know that. And I was angry at myself, the fact that I'd looked at that show for five years and didn't know if you was a Negro, you could just come and do your act and leave. You could never sit on the couch. And I felt so bad, I didn't even tell my wife. And then after the Hefner thing and then the Time Magazine, I get a call. My wife pick up the phone. Jack Parson, she happy, and she don't know. So I go, uh, Dick Gregory, uh, Mr. Sorsen, I'm Jack Paul's producer. We read this wonderful article in Time Magazine, and Mr. Paul wanted to know, can you come on the show tonight? I said, no, I don't want to work for Jack Parson. And I hung up. And I started crying. I got ready to tell my wife, and the phone rang again. He's back in the school. I know you think this is a hex and ox. I said, I do not want to work for Jack Parson. And I hung up again. Phone ring again, and it's Jack Paul. Did Greg with Mr. Paul? How come you don't want to work my show? I said, because the Negroes never sit on the couch. And he said, well, come on in. I'll let you sit on the couch. Now, let me tell you how important that was. When I went on the Jack Paul show that night, I was making $200, $250 a week. When I sit on that couch, my salary went to $5,000 a night. That's how powerful that man was. And that's the first time white folks heard a black person. They didn't hear my mama. My mama ain't went to work with them white folks telling about her son or my daughter's brilliant or my daughter's in school. Matter of fact, where I live, if you had a Cadillac, most black folks parked it like six blocks away from work because they felt them white folks saw it, they'd be fine. That was the atmosphere then. Then I started getting these thousands of letters, man. Because I'm sitting on the couch talking about my children, you know, saying a little funny. And white folks saying, I didn't know black children and white children were the same. There were no black news people. There were no black people doing the weather, you know. There were no black people intellectually that was exposed to a handful. All right. Thank you, John. Let's hear it for your next
observational. And I think a lot of people observe the same things that I observe. It's just that they may not be thinking about it. You know, you go to the supermarket and buy stamps. They have one set. They sell you that set, and that's it. You go to the post office, and they're always like, well, which booklet do you want? Like, I care. One of my friends, she says, you know, Sam, I only buy stamps with black people on them. Because, you know, I'm supporting black people. I'm like, no, you're not. You're supporting the post office. I mean, you actually think that Louis Armstrong gets a cut off of these stamps? I mean, it's ridiculous. The humor is the sponge, and the water that's in it is the actual joke. And what you gotta do is you take that sponge and you squeeze it, and you squeeze it, and you squeeze it, so you can't think of anything else. But a lot of people, you know, both black and white, all ask me the same question. Sam, why do you talk like that? I'm like, <laughs> I don't know. shocked by things I say. I'm shocked 
by what comes out of my mouth. Because sometimes I don't know what's coming out, but it comes out funny, and that's a gift. I've learned a lot about racism as a comic. It's like I've seen people let a white comic in their room without listening to them, but they assume that a black comic might be too dirty or raw, so you know they they gotta do all kind of stuff just to become a part of that club or they may get turned down. We're going to get an election perspective from the Rick Younger Show's very own field correspondent, Mark Theobald. Yeah. First of all, we got uh, Barack Obama. That's the, he could be the first black president. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's, yeah, that's first black president. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's not going to happen. Uh, <laughs> number one, he's black. All right. <laughs> uh, number two, he's in America. So, uh, <laughs> first. After the end finishes, then we'll have, uh, it'll be around the time that Jim Gaffigan goes on. Ladies and gentlemen, here is Foster. <laughs> <laughs> elbow, elbow, wrist. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kareth Foster. I'm a very clean comic. Yeah, I'm sleeping here. I just happen to have big boobs. It's not my fault. <laughs> Fletcher. I'm the MC for tonight's festivities. I'm Leanne Lord, the First Lady of Laughter. <laughs> Hi, I'm Joanna Briley. I am a new comic a to the and uh, stage manager for the Sold Out Comedy Show. Uh, Rick Younger, Pisces. Yeah, he's going to um, like that. Yeah. I need some, I need some Brooklyn. I'm kind of running the, Brooklyn Brooklyn the asylum this evening. Yeah. And now, coming to the stage, your host and MC for the evening. He plays all over the country, one of New York's finest. I want you to give it up for Clayton! Broadway Comedy Club, and there's a school in York, Pennsylvania where I did a show. Yeah, it was a middle school, like a prep school. Yeah, and like after the show, all these little kids are writing to me on MySpace, like, hey, let's be friends. I thought that was great. But now I worry what people think when they go to my MySpace page. And they notice that most of my friends are 10-year-old boys. I'm like, this close to a visit from Dateline NBC. So I do. <laughs> I don't want to disappoint. I was I was born and raised here in, a, in South Jamaica, Queens. Me and 50 Cent. Thank you. Very much. <laughs> well, yeah. Keep it loud. It is a rough area. Man. I actually had a man in my audience one night. He's like, wow, I got shot at one time in South Jamaica. I was like, I'm sorry. <laughs> Did I get you? <laughs> Sometimes stereotypes can work to your advantage. And I can say that because as a black man, I have to deal with stereotypes all the time, most of which are negative. But there is one <laughs> that we never hope to have debunked. <laughs> and that's that male endowment thing. And once again, that is based on truth. For the most part, all of us are pretty clean. Yeah. So I mean, it's not, so it's just something that we naturally do anyway. So we just like, well, we might as well put it, let's just put a clean show together. Yeah. If we wanted to get away from stereotypes, one of the things that I used to always say about it uh, in the beginning is like, when they go looking for black comics, they tend to go looking for the stereotypes. Like, how your mother ever was doing to this mother ever? You know, it's like, it's like they think every... Like, you ever be having a fee in her day and a day and a fee and she go, no, oh, oh, give me more day in my day. As black performers, you find that the stereotype is pretty negative. It, what I find to be very funny is when people come up to me and say, you're the whitest black guy I know. Yeah. I mean, I think people forget that our type of comedy is just like comedy at large. There are different aspects and different flavors. I do love to read, man. I'll be honest. If books were illegal, I'd be in jail, y'all. I had to get all hardcore about it, too. You know, get a tattoo of my favorite book, Harry Potter, what was? <laughs> I actually shared that story with somebody, and uh, they stopped me in the middle of it. And they were like, oh my god, Leanne, you read Harry Potter? How white are you? <laughs> so I guess the next time I'm pulled over by the cops, I can go, it's okay, officer. I read Harry Potter. <laughs> Wow, you're funny for a woman. And I used to get really angry, 
I had to sort of change my mindset about it and go, they are giving me a compliment the best way they know how. Right. If I'm the one you enjoy, then maybe I'm the one that will get you to broaden your mind and come out more. Come on, it's back in the day, rap used to just be fun, right? It used to be just throw your hands in the air, right? Like it just don't care, there you go. Now it's like throw your legs in the air. <laughs> Spread like you just don't care. <laughs> as you want it to be, as long as it's funny. I think there's a direct proportionality relationship. As funny as the joke is, if it's, if it's edgy, it has to be at least as funny as it is edgy. I, uh, I bought my fiance a dog, and um, I bought her a dog. You get a dog, it's gonna be mischievous. You get a poodle, it's gonna be a little prissy dog. You get a pit bull, you don't tell him like pig. These are just things that, <laughs> these are just things that we know. Right? Why do we accept that with people? It's like, oh, you're having a baby. Really? What kind? <laughs> a Mexican. Well, <laughs> they are a hardworking and loyal group. <laughs> but are you sure there's just one of them in there? <laughs> like, I know there's one on the lease, but... elevated to the level of social commentator as well as comedian. Uh, one of the first things they do is simply to expose some of the traditional ways in which people think about and talk about people of various ethnic groups, uh, and then making fun of those people, making them look like idiots. So Margaret Cho would get up there, and she'd go through this whole big line of things about you know how people throw all Asians together in one group and do this other thing. And, and there are people in the audience think, Oh, I do that. I've done that. I've, it was almost like a checklist. And to continue to go out and do and say and think some of those things meant one of two things. Uh, you were either really dense and didn't get the what the whole thing was about, or you were stubbornly going to stick to it, you know, regardless of what she said. So I'm Asian. Yeah. And people ask me weird stuff, you know. They're like, uh, what's it like to be Asian? <laughs> I'm like... What's it like to be dense? <laughs> but it always goes like this. They're like, uh, so uh, where are you from? I'm like, New York, which is normal, right? Yeah. But then there are follow-up questions. They're like, no, 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 no. Where are you really from? <laughs> I'm like, oh, where am I really from? <laughs> New York. <laughs> And they're like, uh, no, 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 no. Where are you originally from? <laughs> oh, 
yeah, I originated in my mother's womb. <laughs> and they're like, uh, no, no, no. Uh, where are your grandparents from? California? <laughs> No, 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 you know what I mean. Where are ancestors from? I'm like, oh, my ancestors. Yeah, it's a common consensus that Homo sapiens originated in Africa. <laughs> How about yours? <laughs> Guys like Richard Pryor, guys like Jackie Mason, their humor was based on the very ethnic stereotypes that had been aimed at them for their entire lives. But they, in presenting it, put a new definition of what is uh, acceptable behavior and what's the kind of behavior that's going to get you made fun of in one of my acts. Some of this ethnic humor was almost like a handbook of this is the stuff that's okay, and this is the stuff that you're really being offensive when you do. But often, the comic will use that very offensive stuff within the acts, which is what makes all this stuff so complex. I, I'm actually biracial. My mom is black, my dad's Indian. So, you know, my house has always smelled like curry chitlins. <laughs> I just graduated from school, and I was thinking about starting my own business, opening a store. So, you know, the Indian side was like, why don't you open a 7-Eleven? Because, you know, that's, that's what we do. That's what we do, you know. That's how we do it. You know, then the black side was like, why don't you rob the 7-Eleven? Because, you know, that's what we do. You know what I'm saying? That, that, that's what we do. Let's see. Y'all can't call me racist because my mama black. So y'all know that means. And I've always been very good at racial jokes. That's from day one. You know, that's been my whole thing. And it's gotten me in a lot of trouble. Black people always have been funny. That's been our uh, uplifting. We've always had to make jokes. We've always had to keep it funny or cut our wrists. White people have always made fun of us since day one with the black face imitating us. The movies in Hollywood, their idea of what we're about, of how they see us, how they feel that we are. They don't actually think that we're human beings, and it's very sad. Hollywood clings onto what it knows, what it's familiar with. Pearl Bailey, I don't know if you remember her. Well, she's back, Queen Latifah. She's Pearl Bailey, come back to get her money. Eddie Griffin, Sammy Davis, come back and get his money. Madonna, Marilyn Monroe, come back to get her money. Chris Rock, Jack Benny show, remember? What was Jack Benny's friend's name? Rochester. Listen to Chris Rock's cadence. He sounds exactly like Rochester. And Chris Tucker, watch Gone with the Wind. Remember with the voice? You know, remember the one? I don't remember the babies. Butterfly McQueen. Come back to get her money. They all come back. They try to do whatever makes white folks comfortable. Sex has a lot to do with it. Back in the day, if a white woman had a little black baby, she'd better hide it to run away with it. They'd kill her in that baby. That white man could have all the little mixed babies in the world. No problem. Do you remember when Wesley Snipes came on the screen? Asian, black, all the women white, they loved Wesley, didn't they? Wesley, sex, sex. That white man said, sex. The next time I saw Wesley, he was a drag queen. And then the third time I saw him, he wasn't even human. He was a vampire. They fixed that. And they always have a love affair with it's the favorite black person for that week or that month or that year. I mean, they were so into Sam L. Jackson, you know that. Those white folks stay up at night not sleeping. You've got to put Sam in a movie. Sam was in movies that black people didn't belong in. Wasn't he in Star Wars? See? But I liked him in Star Wars because the white folks called him Master. Master? I said, I like this movie. And then they killed him. I said, I should have known he was going to kill him the minute they called him Master because apparently he was too dark for the dark side. Africans? I grew up, I didn't know. I don't see an African leader. I saw Tarzan type of Africans, savages. Now think about how clever this is. Because when I'm growing up, and the only Africans I see, I see no Africans in the UN. Where would you see them? Television wouldn't have been. So why would I want to go to Africa to be around them savages? Now it's a different ballgame. You got Africans here to state, you got Mandela type. 
So what do they do? They come off with Blood Diamond and The Last King of Scotland. And I said, man, what filth. Now the actors don't know that. But I got grandchildren. And the way you control me with my thoughts for Africa was showing me savages. The Last King of Scotland and Blood Diamond show you African blood baths. Show them killing women, children. I mean, now listen to these folks talk about the rap or the and you know, and they should. But my problem is that when I used to hear Ray Charles and them and BB King talk, shake your money maker, they weren't talking to white women. And every woman on the planet have a vagina. And they were saying to black women, you know, you can sell that. And nobody got upset about it. You know, I mean, think about that. And if I had my way today, I, I'd make all black folks stay in the house for a month and listen to number of the music. Because think about, we're the only man on this planet, a black American man, that sings derogatory songs about our women. Think about that. That's what them, that's what them dirty blues are. I caught you in bed with my best friend. One, two, three, four, give me some more. And listen to a hillbilly record and see if he ever say anything negative about that trail of living white woman. Baby, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Give me another chance. I mean, think about it. So when the Russians hear me as a black man singing derogatory words about the black woman and your sister go to Russia to a medical convention with five doctors agree, why wouldn't they think she a hoe? They didn't hear the Ku Klux Klan say that. They heard me say that. I was in the Academy of Water. Out of all the black folks two years ago that write beautiful music, the one that they picked is hard out here being a pimp. I mean, remember now, California is not Ku Klux Klan. Those are supposed to be our friends. America decodes, I am race. America is race. You cannot live in America and not experience racism. People pretend, like, oh, I don't know. Oh, is it really like that? That's all a, a crack of, a bowl of crap. They know. They don't, they don't like it. I could sit in the, in, on stage and talk about religion all night. Ain't nobody gonna go nowhere. I can talk about sex, ain't nobody gonna move. But I get to talking about that race, give it 10 to 15 minutes. They're gonna get up and leave. You can't beat them, join them, because white folks join them. They didn't like it, just like they didn't like cornrows, just like they didn't like coarse and nappy hair. So why on us is, is it, it, it's ugly, but on them it's cute. Cicely Tyson wore her cornrows, and she was a picaninny. Bo Derek put cornrows in her hair, and the, she has a complexion for the protection, and she's a 10. Has anybody heard of Plano, Texas? Yeah. Okay, a lot of you. That's where I grew up, okay? And just in summary, Plano is an affluent suburb north of Dallas that happens to have the ethnic diversity of a Klan rally. <laughs> That is not even close to an exaggeration, and I can prove it. I starred in an all-white production of the play A Raisin in the Sun. Comedy is one of the hardest things in the world to do. It really is. And that's why some comedians kill themselves. That's why some comedians are on drugs. They've got a lot of issues. And I happen to be lucky because I wear more than one hat. Because I can write. I can act. I started out dancing. I mean, I, I, have, a, I have a lot of talent. I, I hate to tell you how much because then you'll, you'll get jealous. And so I just try to I keep it hidden because people are such haters. Well, Richard Pryor began to make evident to people that, ooh, maybe this comedy thing isn't so, uh, isn't so innocent after all. I mean, it, it, I think we, we, at that point began to see that comedy could be a form of weaponry. Richard Pryor is the funniest black comedian ever to walk on this planet. He didn't open the door. He, as I said, he kicked that door in. Comedy would be different if Richard never would have done comedy. If we were vampires, Richard would have been Dracula. So that's from Dave Chappelle to Chris Rock to Eddie Murphy. It, all the comedians that you know, they all come from Richard. The, Richard was the tree. They're all the apples on the black side. Make no mistake about it. I don't care who you like, who your favorites. We all have our tastes. We all have our little favorite ones we like. It's Richard. Richard was it. So Richard was so good at telling stories. He was the best storyteller I've ever met. And Mark Twain is the white one. That's the one they, you know, give the credence to. The best storyteller. But Richard was Dark Twain. Arsenio helped me. He put me on this show. He did. I don't, I don't think he really wanted to. The powers that be probably didn't want it, but he did it anyway. 
Arsene and I have worked together on the Motown shows. We had written together, we did stand up together, you know, we go back a long ways. And the white folks are really into Arsenio. I always hear the white people talking. When they start chatting about somebody black, you know they're getting into them. You hear them say their names often. Arsenio was desperate for it. I mean, he had a need to be famous. And he would do anything, everything. And you gotta remember when the show, before it was on Paramount, Arsenio was at his funniest, because he wanted it. When he got on it in the Paramount, he started believing his own reviews. He got into it, he got comfortable. And everyone said, well, it's because he brought Farrakhan on. That's not true. It's because of the ratings. Arsenio got very com comfortable. But when, when Arsenio was hungry, he was at his funniest. And he wanted it. He was on a mission. He was like a crackhead. He was gonna, he was gonna get whatever it was he had to get. I look at a guy like Dave Chappelle, who I, I would put up there with Chaplin and Keaton and uh, Ernie Kovacs, among the one of the some of the funniest comic minds that have worked in this country. Yet, man, talk about a complicated guy. I mean, I don't even know. Should I be laughing at this? Am I right to laugh at this? Should I only laugh at this when I'm alone? Uh, uh, all of this kind of thing. He really managed to take all of those issues that everybody was talking about and bouncing back and forth and everything and put into a, uh, a perspective that no one had ever seen before. His whole TV show started on that uh, sketch, one sketch for one idea he had about, uh, what's his name, Clayton Biggs, the, white, uh, um, uh, the black white supremacist. He was blind, so he never knew uh, whatever. Um, that was one of the most complex, I think, interesting, and at the same time, very funny treatments of the issue of race in America that I'd seen in a long time. And it didn't come from a scholar, it didn't come from a historian, it didn't come from a journalist, it came from a comedian. Practically every sketch that guy did was like, man, I'm sure glad I didn't say that. You know, like I said, I was afraid to laugh at what Chappelle did, much less tell the joke. Um, but what he did was really opened up a whole number of interesting kinds of issues. And uh, uh, talk about a mercenary. I mean, not only was he paid for it, he was eventually was, was driven insane by it. He finally walked away from that whole gig because he was worried that what he was doing with the intention of trying to raise consciousness and satirize this stuff, that maybe he was just propagating it. And that's the big question in comedy is, does ironic distance and critique and burlesque and uh, uh, satire really, in fact, challenge and try to knock down the things you're satirizing? Or in the end, does satire simply establish the very things more strongly than ever before? That was, I think, the big problem Chappelle had when he walked away from that show. Unfortunately, most of us aren't as smart as Dave Chappelle, and I think a lot of people just didn't get what he was doing. Dave Chappelle called me and asked me to do the show. I wasn't going to do the show because I didn't want those white folks messing with my material. And he said, I won't let them. Because I said, they wouldn't know funny if it bit them in their behind. And he said, I won't let anybody do anything. I went down, and they didn't touch my stuff, and the rest is history. I did what I, I mean, you know, Negro Damas, I did everything that I did. And don't you remember when the air when I said, keep doing what you're doing, they're gonna come get you, you won't be on here. Do you remember that, it was, it was a sketch one time, and I said it, you can watch the show. I said, oh, keep it up, and you won't be doing this. We're actually the whores of comedy. They pimp us. He reversed the game. He made them the whore, and he became the pimp. The move he made was to prove to the world that a white man's face on a green piece of paper does not make you wealthy. Because you know you've never seen a Brinks truck follow a hearse, and you won't. And we have to give the Egyptians an A for effort, because they tried to take it with them. Okay? All right? And so he told them no about that money, and they said he was a drug addict, he's crazy, he's having a breakdown, that money. Because the word was out, it was 50 million, it was actually 75 million. He told those white folks, no, can you imagine? That's like a slave said, I don't want to be free. You know what I'm saying? That's just, that's just out of the, what? They couldn't get ready for that. He reversed the game, and he made the move that white folks have been telling us to do for years. How many times have you heard, go back to Africa? That's exactly where he went. And, I mean, he was on everybody's lips. Why? Where's Dave? And you know that. He was on the cover of every magazine, American and foreign. He was on everything. 
I had to look on my license and make sure it wasn't on it. <laughs> Good crowd, ain't nobody's cell phone gone off, praise the Lord. Because everybody got cell phones now, don't they? Don't they? Remember the first cell phones that came out? Remember, remember how big the phone was? You be like, hello? Come pick me up, pick me up. I don't even know where I am. My name is Sean Sarvis. I am a clean slash Christian comedian. Been doing comedy for 15 years. Been on BT's Comedy View six times, Teen Summit, The Apollo. You ever see people fall asleep on the subway? Yeah. But never miss they stop? Yeah. How do you know when they stop us coming? They be on the green line the whole ride, knocked out. Tell us a. For the first 10 years of my career, I was cursing and saying all that type of stuff. But on the brink of being a father and in my Christianity, I said, I, you know, I had to make a change. So uh, I wanted to represent my family to the fullest. I wanted to represent God to the fullest. So I changed my life. I'm going to tell you something. Single brothers, women would not have gas for the first three months you started going out with it. And ladies' gas is totally different than ours. Their gas is tough. Guys, we'd be in a bathroom. We'd be using the bathroom. We'd be like... Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies gas sink. My ex-girlfriend passed gas in my living room. She scared me. She was like, oh. I said, well, what was that? Nothing. <laughs> then she did it again. Oh. I said, no, what's wrong? I think it's a crack in the floor right here. My act was really already clean. It was just cuts were sprinkled. But now it's clean, and I'm just happy to make all ages like If I had a next door neighbor, he was six years old, and he would see me on TV, he always wanted to come to my shows, and he could never come because I was in the club cursing. But now he's able to, he's older now, but he's able to go at 12. So it's a blessing. It's, it's a real blessing. So I'm honored to represent the few that's doing clean comedy, and the best is yet to come. So right now I'm just kind of like going through my my book here. Um, it's my notebook, one of many books that I have here. And uh, I just might um, either come up with a brand new idea or I'll take an idea that I was working on before and just keep trying to perfect it and work at it and work at it and work at it. In social studies, you know, of course, you know, when you, you talk about slavery and everything, you would see the word like Negro. And for some reason, I never liked that word at all. People would really, really look at me like, you know, like, am I gonna like snap or something like that? And I didn't like that at all. When I first heard it, you know, it caught me by surprise because I was like, well, damn, they referred us to us Negroes or whatever. And I thought that was like a bad thing or whatever. Everyone looked at me and if, if their, you know, their eyes were like, I, if people could look at you in their eyes, you know, they could pierce right through you or whatever, it hurt. Well, I felt, I felt like a little hurt. What I did was a after this, like the next year, I would look in my history book and I would look purposely for the word Negroes, right? And I would time it. I'd be like, okay, next Tuesday we're going to read this chapter in class. Wednesday, we're going to read this chapter. And that's where the word Negroes was. I don't want to be here Wednesday. And so what would I do? I would take Wednesday off. I'd fake sick or whatever. I'd come in Thursday. And then I'd find out the teacher was absent yesterday. And now we're going to read this chapter. And we're going to talk about Negroes. I'm like, damn! And not only that, Sam, we want you to read chapter four. There are 256 Negroes. But you look at one of those days in which I was absent. It wasn't asthma, people. It was Negroes. I can't, like, make everyone happy, but I can try to do stuff since I am trying to be cleaner and clean. It's not going to offend people, but kind of is the reality of what's going on, you know what I'm saying? I'm still working on it. I initially thought it was you. The press. Which part? Tell, say the part. It seems as though tonight's performance, you did more ethnic, black related jokes. Is that good or bad? Sometimes you have to read your crowd. There were a nice number of black people here tonight. So, I mean, do you mean ethnic is in painful ethnic yeah. or just... Yes, that's what I was trying to say. No ethnic thing. It isn't. You don't. You're you're smarter than that, so you don't have to do that. But but we live in a society full of different races. I know races. it, and we're trying to fix all of it. And I think that we should have a dialogue. 
I think that we should talk about race in this country. I think that we should talk about it. That's should, why we have you, so many you problems. You should let Jesse do that. No, <laughs> no, we don't have any leaders. Your other stuff, it flows much better. And and, and it's more it's easier on the audience. They don't want to solve world problems and race issues and stuff like that. They just don't want to. So your other stuff is so much better, and the way you deliver it, it sounds so much better, that when you bring the other ethnic stuff up, it really doesn't look it just doesn't do what you want it to do. I feel like comedy should reflect for the individual comedian what it is that they've been through or going through because then I become a puppet. Then I become something safe if for people to feel comfortable. Maybe I don't want you to be comfortable about everything I'm saying. Maybe I want you to think about race. And Maybe I want to evoke passion in people. I love New York City. I love being there because you know what? You will see stuff there that you won't see anywhere else in the world, right? Some of it's amazing, incredible stuff that you can't wait to get on the phone and tell your best friend about. And then some of it's stuff that might actually require therapy. <laughs> a couple weeks ago, I'm walking to an early morning meeting, right? This homeless man comes rushing up to me, stops just short of me, proceeds to drop a trowel and squat. I was horrified, horrified, right? I freaked out. All I could think to do was call my mom back in Texas, right? Now my mom, bless her heart. <laughs> she's special. <laughs> but she's also very much a Southern lady, right? So I can't necessarily use the same colorful language that I'm using with y'all, right? So I'm freaking out. I'm, I'm almost to the brink of tears. I'm like, you're not going to believe this. The most horrible thing just happened. This, this, this homeless man was defecating in front of me. Well, she misheard me because she goes, what? Didn't you stop to help him? <laughs> I go, are you serious? And she goes, you said he was suffocating, right? I go, no. Mother, no. He was he was relieving himself on the sidewalks of New York. She pauses for a second, and I swear to God, the next words out of her mouth were, "Well, at least we know he's eating." <laughs> it was like 100 degrees for like two weeks out here, man. It's awesome. We don't ruin the planet. Al Gore was right, I guess. That's why they gave him the, the Nobel Peace Prize. They were like, okay, you win. <laughs> 100 degrees, man. Let me tell you something. When it gets to 100 on a regular basis, I realize I am African hyphen American. <laughs> I'm not pure blood African, B. I'm a watered down strain of Africa because I cannot deal with the heat the way my, my people must be from the shaded part of Africa, son. <laughs> A, I want to get on stage, work my craft, and B, I want to get on stage and make some money, you know, so I, I shoot through the clubs and keep, you know, keep the jab right, you know, keep the camera moving because I'm kind of fast, you know. Got at 820 at the lab back. Now, my next spot ain't until 1130. Then I have a 1210. Now, that's cutting it a little closer. Then I got a 1250 at the back. And then I'm going to shoot back up here at 135, and that'll be my last spot. I'm coming, sir. I come in this way all the time. That's right, too. Our headliner tonight, he was featured on three or four seasons of Saturday Night Live. Very funny. He's been on The Tonight Show as well as uh, Jay Leno. Please give it up for the one and only Mr. Dean Edwards, everybody. Dean Edwards. Give it up for Mr. Dean Edwards. This is the only city on the planet where it's Halloween and you can't tell if people wear costumes or not. <laughs> you, know, you be complimenting, yo, that yo, costume yo. is hot. This ain't no costume. <laughs> so I wear it. I wanted to do this since since September '83 when Eddie Murphy Delirious premiered, man. I remember I told I told my mother that night. I said, Ma, that's what I'm gonna do. And my family supported me, man. And you know. 19 years later, I was I was uh, on Saturday Night Live following Eddie's steps, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, you put it out there, put it in the universe, and it too can happen. Money makes you look good. Money clears up all your deficiencies. You could be a Wookiee from Star Wars, you got money. So a Wookiee getting out of Maybach, somebody walk by like, oh. <laughs> What is 
your name. Come here, Chewbacca. I want to talk to you. When you use, say, the label clean comic, it, it automatically sort of puts a stigma and stipulations on what people can or can't do. I don't curse on stage, but that's just, that's me. What made me stop cursing um, is two things. I remember this, this, uh, this uh, guy did an article. He said, I've never, I don't think we'll ever hear someone use Sinbad and Malcolm X in the same sentence, but Malcolm, I remember he said, it takes an intelligent man to be able to communicate without using profanity. So. I said, oh, well, you know what, that's a challenge. You know, I'll, I'll take that as a challenge on myself and see if I can apply that to my life. And then a girlfriend of mine, she was like, you know what, let's go see Sinbad. I reluctantly went, because I was like, man, Sinbad's one of those clean comics. But I remember going, I saw him at Eastman Kodak Theater up in Rochester, New York. Dude was hilarious. And even more than that, I sat back business-wise, I leaned back, and I was just looking at the audience. He had old people, Young people, black, white. Men don't choose marriage, we get drafted. <laughs> the minister said, you may now kiss your bride. I looked at wife, you met, she looked possessed. The eyes roll up in her head, she started shaking. She looks at me and says, I have you now. <laughs> and her mother was in the front row, leaning forward and said, finish him! <laughs> He's ours. <laughs> he is with us now. Like you do colleges and oftentimes you'll have like that one cat just like, yo man, I want to be a comic. I always encourage it. I'm like, man, go ahead, get on stage, you know, do your thing. Cause worse come to worse, even if you get on stage and you suck, you'll know whether or not it's meant for you to get back on that stage. Cause this is a passion, man. My wife doesn't listen. My wife is British too. My wife is British Jamaican, Jamaican. <laughs> she, she has that accent, man. When we first met, it was, I loved it for two minutes. Now, it gets on my nerves, man. And I can say that because she's not here. <laughs> you know what my problem with her is, man? Because everything she says has that condescension in it. That British, that. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> That's an American hang up, because to us, anyone that's British sounds intelligent. It is like, you know, anytime, are you British, man? Yeah, but true, like, I guarantee if, it, if you speak to someone American, you're like, hey, and they're like, oh, wow, he must be smart. <laughs> <laughs> that's how we are. My wife actually is smart, man, too, but she's a professor of literature, man. She just got a, a tenure, she's got a bachelor's and master's and a doctorate and now tenure, man. I got jokes. <laughs> I got jokes. That's it. I can't win an argument on my I graduated from community college. So you can't. That's how she wins the argument. Oh, shut up. Touching your degree and in CC. Shut up. <laughs> Isn't your diploma written on a napkin in Crayola? What the? <laughs> you know the hardest thing, too, man, now, like, <laughs> we have two little girls. Two daughters, man, Amori and Tori, those are our little girls. And for some odd reason, they decided they wanted to develop those same irritating accents. <laughs> <laughs> it's frustrating, man. There's nothing worse than having someone smaller than you look up to and talk down to at the same time. I was six down in one night. I think it was a success. Cause I'm eating pizza and drinking ginger ale. Celebrating another fine evening. No, it was cool, man. Important. Like I said before, whether you're a new jack or you're a veteran, keep hitting that stage, baby. Keep the stage warm for me. Cause I'm coming. Comedy is what it is. Here today, going tomorrow, but you gotta keep plugging away and getting your name out there. So that's what I'm doing. One of the things that comedians do is get our dander up, make people in authority mad. I mean, they're the equivalent of the kid who stood up on the table and dropped their pants in school. 
We didn't approve of it. It was tasteless. We certainly don't think it should happen, but it sure got everybody to laugh. And the way you get people to laugh in any culture is to disobey the most sacred rules out there. Our brains aren't wired for democracy. We all want to feel better than somebody else. And if we were born into a caste society, you know, you know you're a Brahmin, or you know you're an untouchable, or you know you're a whatever, you're not going to change it, so you're fine. I mean, that's what you do. That's who you are. You combine social mobility of a democracy, which means you're never sure where you are. And then you start bringing in all of these population immigrants, which are, it's like having a target. Uh, oh, here's the next group. Now at least I have someone to feel superior to.